Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has not, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, God died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. God bless the reading of his word. Well, good morning, everyone. It's yeah, so good to be back in Mesa. Good to see all of you. Um, it's uh, an interesting time to be traveling and interacting with people. Uh, it appears COVID wants to just keep lingering a little while longer, but I hope you all are well and I hope you stay well. And for those in our uh, church family and, and uh, blood family that may be struggling with this virus still will be praying for them. I'm sure we have a few folks joining us online this morning, and so we're grateful that you are tuning in to uh, our worship assembly and worshiping with us today from your home. Well, Happy New Year! 2022. Man, I am really getting old. I'm just, I can't believe it. 2022. Did everybody have a good Christmas? Good New Year. Wonderful. I had a really great Christmas. Let me show you my most two precious gifts uh, from Christmas. And uh, these are our grandchildren. They came to us last year. Uh, so this is Evie and Caden. And I'm so sorry that I have the most beautiful grandchildren in the world. But uh, the rest of y'all will just have to get over that, I guess. But uh, they are just the light of our lives right now. We're having so much fun, and uh, Evie's taking her first steps, and it's just so awesome to be able to see that. You know, and you have your children, and boy, it's great. God gives us kids when we're young, when we've got energy, you know, to, to chase after them. And uh, I don't know, though, as you get older, there just seems to be maybe it's the experience of life that gives you a little bit more depth from which to draw and a little more appreciation from which to draw. So we're so blessed to be able to be a part of their, their lives and uh, them part of uh, ours. So we're um, in a wonderful phase in our search process. Um, if you remember, kind of going back to the beginning, there's four primary phases, and you see those on screen. And we are soon to be into phase four, um, possibly, hopefully, prayerfully, and that's the invitation phase. There are four candidates at this point that the uh, search team is having conversations with and dialogue with and scheduling some full uh, committee interviews with at least three of those four and possibly four out of four. Uh, we'll know that in the next uh, week or so. And so we're uh, hopeful and prayerful that sometime in the next uh, little bit that the search team will have a recommendation to make to your shepherds regarding your uh, finalist. And then you as a congregation ultimately will have an uh, opportunity to meet and be involved in communal discernment if this indeed is the uh, individual, the family God is calling to be your next preaching minister. We'll tell you a lot more about that over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but it's a very, very exciting time, a very exciting time. If for some reason, uh, these finalists, if for some reason it's just not the right match, don't lose hope. Uh, God is in control. And uh, he will get you where he wants you to be, when he wants you to be there, and he gets all the glory and he gets all the honor. As a reminder, notice what underlies the entire process, and it is prayer. And I hope that you are not growing weary in well-doing. Uh, continue to stay in prayer to the Lord. Continue to write notes in the prayer journal. 
uh, that's available to you uh, and uh, just continue lifting up this entire process uh, in prayer. Well, I'm starting a new series with you today, and I'm very excited about this. It's called Discipleship 101. And I want us to just take uh, four weeks to work through this first um, iteration, one of the foundational components of your new mission statement, uh, a church that we believe is, is called to, uh, to grow in Christ and to serve and love and to equip for life. And we're going to talk for these first few weeks about that first piece, that first uh, piece of your mission puzzle, which is to grow in Christ. And so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about discipleship. So today I want to preach really a theological foundation for discipleship, what it means to be a disciple of Christ, where we draw our power, and then over the next two to three weeks, we will really talk more about the nuts and bolts of discipleship, just some very practical application pieces, and so I'll look forward to being in the text with you over these next few weeks. So I preached uh, this lesson, at least a modified version of it, uh, about oh, a year and a half ago at the A&M Church when we were really, really moving into a deeper dive related to discipleship. And that was birthed through one conversation. So never underestimate the power of one conversation. I was sitting down with one of our young scholars uh, who is just one of the brightest young men I've ever met. He's only in his mid-20s but he just happens to have one of these minds, kind of one of those minds that makes you sick. He reads something and remembers it. You, you know anybody like that, okay? I, I barely remember what I did 15 minutes ago, but, but uh, he's just one of these guys that he just reads it and he remembers it. And one of the things that we were talking about as we were dialoguing back and forth on Scripture was how many if-then statements are in the Bible. How many if-then statements? statements. And it kind of blew my mind. I, I, I really never thought about it. And then as I did a deeper dive, I was like, oh my goodness, there's even more when you think about how that relates to discipleship. If this is true, then this must be the outcome or the action that results from that truth. Now we see this all throughout scripture. So notice, for example, in second Chronicles chapter four and verse 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Genesis 11, chapter 6. This is the Tower of Babel narrative. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, build this tower, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. What about the Mount Sinai narrative in Exodus chapter 19, verses 4 through 6? You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations... You will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Deuteronomy 7, verse 12, God's covenant promise, if you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore to your ancestors. Now, the heart of this covenant that we see in Old Testament or these situations where an if-then uh, clause appears, we also see it in the New Testament. Notice, for example, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 10, Paul writes about the power of the Spirit. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Now, there's a bit of a grammar challenge here. If we have any English teachers in the room, you're probably uh, about to, to burst out and hold on a second, because most um, English teachers don't like if then in the same sentence. Now, even in Scripture, we will see sometimes if uh, or possibly the word then, maybe it's omitted. Now, sometimes for the sake of grammatical clarity, but one or both of these two words can be inferred since an outcome is linked to the, the if in the verse, okay? So for instance, think about the tactics that Satan used from 
day one. Let's go all the way back to the creation account. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when, and we could just bracket there, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be open and, we can again infer here, then you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Notice that those tactics haven't changed at all from the very beginning. Same thing happens when Satan is dialoguing with Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, again, bracketing, then tell these stones to become bread. John chapter 8 Jesus is talking about the fruit of discipleship. He says, to the Jews who have believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching. And again, we can infer, well, then you are really my disciples. John 13, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, then, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So here's the reality. There are dozens of if-then correlations in Scripture. But if you think about it, much of our lives revolve around if-then statements. And we start processing a lot of these statements when we're little bitty children. Now here's some of the if-then propositions that we used to hear from our parents. If you don't stop making that face, then it will freeze and be like that forever. Okay? Anybody ever hear that one from your mom or dad or grandparents? If you swallow watermelon seeds, then watermelons will grow in your stomach. Okay, that is not true. Okay? Just dispelling that myth. That is not true. Uh, If you swallow gum, then it takes seven years to digest. Also not true. Anybody told that? Anybody uh, fretting with great anxiety for at least seven years when you swallowed a piece of gum? Okay, you can let that go. It's like two or three days and you're, you're good, okay? If you swim too soon after eating, then you will drown. Also not true. Not true. Especially if you're eating watermelon underwater, as you can see by the young man in the picture there. You can go ahead and jump right in. It's going to be fine. You're, you're going to live. Sometimes, though, parents didn't have to go the if-then route. Sometimes we inferred a then, even if there was not an overt if. I'll give you an example. Mom was reading the story of Adam and Eve with her son at bedtime. Came across the part in the story where God took one of Adam's ribs, and from it formed a wife from Adam. So a few days later, mom hears this groaning sound coming from another room, and she walks in to see her son lying on his back, and he's holding his side, and he said, honey, what's wrong? And he said, I think I'm getting a wife. Okay, so anyway, there you go. Sometimes we infer. Sometimes we infer. In the world of mathematics, any math people in the room? Any math people in the room? Okay, some of you are holding up your hand, some of you are not holding up your hand because you're thinking I'm going to ask you to actually say something about if-then statements. So in geometry, if-then statements help us with deductive reasoning. The if part of the statement is called the hypothesis, and the then part is called the conclusion. Does this sound familiar, math people? Okay. Hypotheses followed by a conclusion is called an if-then statement or a conditional statement. What about computer programming? Any computer programmers in the room? Yeah, we've got a handful of those. An if-then statement is a conditional statement, right? So if proved true, then a function or a display of information takes place. So all of that to say our world is filled, our daily lives, they're filled with one after another if-then statement. Um, Not all of us are math people. Not all of us are computer programming people. There is one universal truth that all of us know, though, when we think about if-then statements, and that is, if it is on the internet, then it must be true. Albert Einstein, who invented the light bulb, 1996 to present. So, 
Some of y'all about two o'clock this afternoon are going to be, oh, oh, I see what you did right there. I see what you did right there. Okay, seriously. If then statements permeate almost every aspect of our lives, if this happens, then. If that happens, then. If you say, if the money doesn't come in, if the rent goes up, if she breaks up with me, the list goes on and on and on and on. But there's one overarching if-then phenomenon that helps us put every if-then situation we will ever face into its proper perspective. Are you ready for it? If Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then that changes everything. I love this quote by Timothy Keller. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. I think the impact of the most powerful if-then statement ever made is explained by the Apostle Paul in Romans 6. Paul walks us here through the foundational building blocks of discipleship. So let's read through verses 1 through 14 today. And I'm going to invite you to write these words deeply on your hearts. Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase by no means? We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Now, let's just pause right there for a second. Shall we go on sinning? I don't think... Paul is exclusively here talking about behavior. I think he's asking a a question um, similar to a question that a loving father might ask a son who's left home and is wasting his life. Kind of a, are you going to stay in that mess? Are you going to take up permanent residence and distant country, or, and this is a big or, are you coming home? So I have one very simple question I just want to process right now. Is your life a mess? If the answer to that question is yes, my life is a mess, if the answer is yes, then it's not going to get any better by sinning more. Paul continues by asking, don't you know there's a better place? Don't you know there's a better purpose? He puts it this way. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. I quoted Timothy Keller earlier. I want to quote N.T. Wright now. I love what he observes on this passage. He says, Paul's strong argument, it's not simply that there are two ways to live and that one must choose between them, it is that the baptized, and that would be disciples of Jesus, 
The baptized have changed their ground and must learn to behave according to the territory they now find themselves in, like someone moving to a new country and having to learn the appropriate language. I think that's why later in the chapter, Paul uses Exodus parallels to warn against attitudes and behaviors that would be like Israel going back to Egypt and becoming slaves all over again. You see, when we say goodbye to our former way of life, and when we commit ourselves to Jesus, and when we die to self, our baptism proclaims to the world, I am His and He is mine. And I have a new life. In the the same way that Israel went through water and they were no longer slaves to sin, so have I been released from my chains through baptism. And I have a new address. I live in a different place. A newer praise song that's encouraging Christians worldwide to own their new identity to own their new address goes like this, and I love these words. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. If you know this part, sing it with me. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. So why be baptized? Why be baptized? Because we believe what Jesus said is truth. And not only what he said, but what he did. The dead body of Jesus went into a tomb, and his raised body came out of that same tomb. And if he lives, if he lives, then that changes everything. Paul puts it this way, for if... We have been united with him in a death like his, and we can infer the then here, then we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. And I want to encourage you, don't race past that verse. Just dwell in it. Soak it in. Do you have troubles and worries in this life? All of us do, right? However, believers in Jesus see these troubles differently than those who don't know Jesus. We see trouble through the lens of hope. We know that trouble is not the end. Rather, trouble is a means to a God-honoring end. A little less than a year ago, I sat in a living room of a couple at our church. The husband's body was riddled with cancer. And some of the last words he spoke to me on this earth were these. He said, it's all in God's hands. He wasn't just talking about the cancer. He was talking about everything. It's all. It's all in God's hands. And that's what, that's what being united with Christ in baptism does to us and for us. Becoming a disciple of Jesus doesn't make temptation go away, but it does make us view temptation differently. It doesn't take all the pain away, but it opens our eyes to the presence of God in the pain. 
and how we bear it to his honor and to his glory. And the list goes on and on and on. If we believe he lives, then everything is changed. Paul explores this a little bit more, just in case his readers aren't getting it. <laughs> he, wants to, he wants to circle back around one more time. And he says in verse seven, uh, verses 6 and 7, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. I've said it several times, but can I say it again? If Jesus lives, then that changes everything. Paul has another if-then statement for his readers in this passage. Verse 8, now if we died with Christ, then we believe that we will also live with him. Now, there's two messages, two meanings at work here, I think. Meaning one, we will live with him in this life. And we will partner with him in his mission, the ultimate mission of God, to restore God's original and intended creation. Go back to your archive, to the very first sermon that I preached here back in June of last year to learn more about that. But there's a second meaning, and that is that we will also live with him eternally. One day, this body is going to be returned to the earth, but that's not the end. We will live with him. Here's how it works, Paul writes, beginning in verse 9, For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. If you believe it, if you embrace this truth with all your heart, if you embrace this truth with all your heart, then, if, then, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather, Offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Because, because, for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Earlier I read this quote from Tim Keller. I think it's worth repeating. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. Next week, we're going to be in John 8. If Jesus sets us free... And that's when we begin talking about the fruit of discipleship. I just want to leave you with a question today. And here it is. Do you believe Jesus rose from the dead? Do you believe he rose from the dead? If you say yes, then if you haven't already, would you join him in that resurrection power by being baptized? The water's ready. A couple of the elders in just a few moments will be right down here in the front. We're going to sing a song together. You can just take a few steps and say to one of these brothers, I believe, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I believe he is my Lord. I believe he is my Savior. And I want to be baptized to have my sins washed away. Please don't delay as we share this song together in honor of the one who gave his life for us. Let the Lord